Good morning, my name is Wayne Hansen. I'm a resident of Ashby Ponds, a veteran myself. And today we're going to continue the conversation with World War II veterans. And I have uh, today my very special friend, Robert Cameron. We call him Scotty. And he's going to tell us about his experiences uh, during World War II. So let's start off. Where, where did you come from? What was your background? Well, I grew up on a farm in South Dakota, and I lived there until I got out of high school. Then I, I took a course in sheet metal construction in Omaha and went to work for Northwest Airlines in St. Paul. Uh, they had contracts with uh, the uh, manufacturers of B-24s and B-25s and we would put modifications on them depending on what theater of operation they were headed for. <laughs> and I did that for a year and then I got drafted and I was sworn in on my 19th birthday at Fort Snelling, Minnesota. Where, uh, where were you uh, on December 7th, 1941? Well, I was, I was at home. Uh, my my father died when I was uh, just a baby, and my mother and I went to live with her folks on their farm near the small town of Wilmot, South Dakota. And uh, in the winter time, I used to uh, stay in town with my Cameron grandparents on the during the week and on the weekend I'd go home uh, to the farm and uh, so on December 7th I was home on the farm and I remember walking to school the next morning I came across the principal and we were walking together and I said well it looks like we're in it and he said we sure are and you guys are going next <laughs> and, and sure enough, we all did. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. So what was your uh, first assignment? Well, uh, at the time, if you, uh, if you were drafted and if you had a high school diploma, you could volunteer for flight training. So I did that and I went through the aviation cadet program, mostly in uh, bases in Texas. Except the second phase of training was at uh, Garden City, Kansas. And whoever named that place had a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, we, we graduated in uh, the first of February, 1945. And uh, the war was slowing down and the pipeline was filling up. And most of us were laying around in pilot pools. And, I happened to be in, uh, at uh, San Antonio and uh, they came in with, a, with our uh, roster divided into two groups and they sent half of us back to our advanced flying base for P-40 transition and gunnery and they sent the other half to B-29 flight engineer school which, as you can imagine, was a fate worse than death for <laughs> hotshot fighter pilots <laughs> or, or wannabes. <laughs> and fortunately, I got in the P-40 group, and uh, I uh, stayed on as a gunnery instructor, uh, which allowed me to get a little more flying time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was out of service from uh, 46 to 48, I went to school in Southern California and studied aeronautical engineering. And then uh, I was recalled in 1948 and stayed in for 30 more. Wow, wow. Ha, um, during this gunnery period, you were training who on gunnery? Fighter pilots, bomber, yeah, gunners, what? Uh, fighter pilots. It was a fighter gunnery school. Mm -hmm. 
Were they a unique bunch? Pardon? Were those uh, fighter pilots a unique bunch? Well, we like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, <coughs> one, uh, I had one group of, uh, of Tuskegee Airmen, and uh, recently when there was a big uh, flyover in Washington of yes. World War II aircraft, they uh, had the aircraft dispersed around the area for people to come and have a look. And a friend of mine and I went down to, uh, I forget the name of the airport, but it's down south of here. And uh, one of the pilots who was flying a P-51 uh, was the son of a Tuskegee Airman. And I told him that I had taught a group of his father's uh, uh, fellow pilots to, to shoot gunnery at the uh, fighter gunnery school. He was really excited about that. And uh, well, it, it was it was great stuff. Now you were in the Army Air Force. <coughs> yes. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I, I, went, <laughs> I, I, I went out in a green suit in '48 and '46, rather, and came back in a blue suit in '48. <laughs> As the uh, Air Force then, yeah. it had changed. Yes, yes. You got a unique uh, uh, lapel pin, a set of wings with a star over it and a wreath around it. What is that symbol? Well, there, there are three categories of pilots in the Air Force. The basic pilot is the, the basic wing. And if you have a star, it's senior pilot, which indicates you've had uh, seven years and I think 2,000 hours of flying time. And for command pilot, you had a wreath around the star, and that indicates that you've had 15 years of service and 3,000 hours of flying time. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, uh, during this time, what was your most uh, exciting event? Probably. Uh, we, we had a we had a fellow in our class named Lubavitch, and he was always pushing the envelope and trying new things and coming in and bragging about it. <laughs> well, he checked out in the P-40 the day before I did and came in. We were all under instruct, in strict instructions not to do any acrobatics on the first few hours. and. Uh, so he came in and said on his check ride he'd done a split S, which is you roll over and pull through like that, come out flying level at the bottom. Well, I, the next day I got up and I thought, well, if Lubavitch can do a split S, I sure can. So I, I rolled over and pulled through and I was going faster than I'd ever imagined when I got about that stage. So when I got up, I had to, I had a lot of speed. I figured well, I'll do an Immelman, which is you come out and roll out at the top. And uh, I got about that position, and it, I ran out of speed all of a sudden, and it snapped into a spin. So I guess the most exciting thing that ever happened to me was and I recovered from a spin with a half hour's flying time in a P-40. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell your uh, commanders about it? Oh no. <laughs> that, that was the, the bad thing. I, I had this wonderful tale and I couldn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> of all the planes you flew, what was your, your favorite one? Well, the P-51 is my favorite uh, propeller plane. Eventually, I got to fly a T-33 jet trainer. If I hadn't flown it, I might still be flying. I got too much altitude and not enough cabin pressure and wound up with sort of an aggravated case of the bends and they grounded me. Ah. But it was fun while it lasted. 
Well, a lot of people say the P-51 is what saved the uh, uh, air war in Germany. Well, I think that's probably true. Yeah, the uh, uh, Eighth Air Force lost about 80,000 airmen during that campaign, and they were uh, thinking about canceling daylight bombing until the P-51 came along. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great point. Um, you were talking, when we talked about earlier, you mentioned that you had uh, uh, got involved in the design of an aircraft. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, when I was in... Yeah, I'll uh, hold it up like that. There we go. Okay. Uh, when I was studying aeronautical engineering in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Southern California, at, uh, Grand Central Airport. They had uh, they had two courses there. They one was the engineering course, and they also had a mechanics course on the other side of the field. Well, the mechanics discovered that by uh, putting a combustion chamber uh, along with a, what they call a Type B supercharger, which was common in all the large bomber aircraft they could uh, make a pretty effective uh, jet engine. So they came up with the idea of designing a lightweight uh, jet aircraft for civilian use. And they picked uh, two of us who were students at the time to design an airframe to go around the jet engine that the mechanic side had developed and I was one of the guys the other fellow was Bill Waxon so we called the airplane the XLC-1 for Waxon and Cameron and uh, this is what it looked like and we I still think it's a pretty nice looking airplane but when they ran into the uh, hard facts of how much money it was going to take to build one, they came up a little short <laughs> and they uh, talked to the various manufacturers that were in the area, North American and uh, was one and uh, Douglas was another and Boeing and Seattle was another. But <clears throat> to their surprise, the school surprise, that is. Nobody was anxious to jump on this and com commit a lot of money to a brand new idea. So I always tell people, be aware of starting vast projects with half-assed ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the more important question is, did you get an A in that course? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What did, uh, what did you do after you uh, finally left the service? Well, I'd, uh, uh, I'd been active in the Boy Scout program for quite some time. I was uh, involved in the adult leader training program, which they call the Wood Badge program. And uh, I took that course in Germany and then uh, worked on the staff for several other courses, both in, in Germany and back here in the States when I retired. And uh, so that was very, very interesting work. My, my two sons were scouts. My oldest boy uh, was an eagle. And the, uh, the, the second son uh, was right behind him all the way until we, well, we went to Germany and he got involved in youth sports and never went to another scout meeting. <laughs> that and girls takes them away from the scout meeting, doesn't it? Well, however, he, he did uh, 
he did qualify and attended the Air Force Academy, so I can't fault him too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, interestingly enough, I used to live out at the Air Force, uh, near the Air Force Academy when it first got started at Larry Air Force Base, and they were building the Academy. And um, uh, at the time, they thought the only thing, the only purpose of the Academy was to train fighter pilots. And so their football team used to play the local high school teams and got beat badly. And so finally someone decided, I guess, well, maybe we can put a little bigger guys in those Air Force <laughs> cockpits. <laughs> <laughs> so you were in the Army Air Force, yeah. the Air Force, yeah. and had duties with the Navy. Well, I, I was... Uh one of, one of my assignments uh, was a joint uh, staff assignment on what they call the command post afloat, which was an alternate for the primary military command post in the Pentagon. The, the Army has a, a backup command post in the mountains north of uh, Washington, and the Air Force has an Air Force uh, or an airborne command post, and the Navy has uh, two ships assigned as the command post to float. And uh, I had two years duty as a communications officer on the on the staff of the command post mm -hmm. to float. One of the uh, interesting things I think about uh, retired military is the. Uh, uh, give back to their communities in so many ways. Yours, of course, was the Boy Scout movement. And I think you really underestimate the value of your contribution because <laughs> you showed me this particular thing, which among scouts we understand, but maybe not a lot of people do. <laughs> Tell us about that. What is it? Well, that's called the Silver Beaver. And uh, it's, uh, oh, I don't know. I, I guess it's about halfway up on the scale of awards that are available to scouters. They have uh, silver antelope and silver buffalo also. And uh, that represents quite a few years of service. And uh, Mostly, I was in uh, in a staff position mm -hmm. as a adult leader training and uh, in uh, uh, the advancement uh, part of it, which I found very interesting to work in advancement because that's that's where you see what comes out the top. <laughs> yes, if you. Uh, have a troop that's generating a lot of Eagle Scouts, well, you know that something right is happening there. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, uh, actually, I, I received this award after I had retired and was uh, working in the local Scout uh, 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 can't remember the name of the organization, <laughs> but the uh, council, mm -hmm. the local area council. And that was, that was very exciting. <laughs> the most exciting part of it was how they got me to be present at the night I was supposed to receive the award because I, my my wife and I had planned on going over to Bowling for dinner, and uh, they made up some excuse why she had to come by and deliver some cookies or something for <laughs> some event. <laughs> and I, I was all upset about this because we were late and in a hurry, and. The, we we got there and I saw all my all my scouter friends lined up, and they 
said, well, hurry up. You're, you're going to be late for the presentation. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, come on in. You'll find out. So <laughs> I went in and they ordered me the Silver Beaver, <laughs> which I would have been delighted to participate in if I'd had any indication. <laughs> that what was coming about, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's... Uh, I saw this on your wall, and I thought it might be something interesting. It's, it's your uh, plaque showing your, your rank from second lieutenant oh, yeah. up to colonel, and the awards and decorations that you received for your service. Well, there's fairly routine uh, indication of, of ribbons here. And like I explained earlier, the uh, pilots exist in three categories, the basic pilot, the senior pilot, and command pilot. And that, of course, is the officer's insignia. And uh, the various military rank, that's the Vietnam service ribbon, service ribbon there. Which ones came out of uh, World War II? Which of the decorations? Oh, let's see. Up there, and except for Vietnam, that would be the uh, service area uh, ribbons. And uh, I, I didn't get to do much in World War II, really. I was uh, a gunner instructor, and that was about it. The uh, majority of my service was after I was recalled. Well, each, uh, each one of us does what we're assigned, so uh, we appreciate the work. Now, two more questions before I let you go. Okay. First. Would you do it all over again? Oh, in a minute. And it's in if a minute, they, huh? If, if they'd let me, I'd have stayed on. <laughs> <laughs> and second, they, the they second question was, what would you tell young people if you were, say we had an audience of young people, what would you tell them about military service and um, the well, like? You'll find it's uh, very rewarding because you uh, you have a, a chance to travel and meet uh, interesting people, interesting situations. You get involved in foreign cultures and uh, you're, you're able to see that you're, what you do really has a positive influence on the on the world in general, and uh, I, I think it's a tremendously rewarding uh, career. Well, Scotty, I want to personally thank you for your service to the military well, and to the you. scouting program, which is dear to my own heart, and uh, thank you for volunteering to come up and tell your story. Well. For what it's worth, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's your story, and you're going to stick to it, eh? Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And this concludes our conversation with uh, my good friend, Scotty Cameron, and hope you enjoy it. You mentioned uh, that your, uh, your gunnery school time. Mm -hmm. um, where was that performed, and what kind of things, how did you go about teaching gunnery to these these young people? Well, you, you have a combination of classroom work and air time, and the idea is to teach them how to approach a target and, uh, and get hits on the target. And the normal routine is to have a, a plane 
towing a target behind it on a long cable and so you'll be traversing in this direction and you'll come around like this and come into a firing position and then break away. So the uh, amount of hits that you get on the sleeve tells how good a shot you are and uh, the uh, I forget the exact title, but I think expert is the top grade, and uh, the uh, the the whole idea is to get into the habit of quickly assuming a firing position that will get hits on a target and uh, you're sort of restricted in a training situation because you have to observe local uh, ground rules about airspace and so forth whereas in combat it's every man for himself in whatever direction you can go mm -hmm. but uh, the the idea is to train people to use their their uh, equipment in such a way that they can quickly assume a a firing position that will get hits on the target and uh, some are better than others and some don't make it at all but uh, it, it's a very very interesting uh, proposition and it's a uh, to me it was the, the the best thing about flying was the aerial gunnery and the ability to pass on a little of your knowledge to the next guy and hope that he can do the same the thing I was always interested in was uh, the the war record that the uh, Tuskegee Airmen racked up and I like to think that maybe some of my guys got some of those kills <laughs> when they were escorting the uh, bombers mm -hmm. although I, I came along pretty late in the system I don't know if any of my Tuskegee Airmen students actually got into the action or not but uh, we we uh, taught them what they needed to know to get started. You know, I would, I would think about all the people in this exercise. The one I would not want to be is the guy pulling the, the sleeve and having a bunch of brand new pilots shooting at it. <laughs> I, I was towing the sleeve one time for uh, a, a, a bunch of F-86 pilots in the first fighter group at uh, Riverside, California. And one of the guys had a tendency to follow the target down too close. And if you're, you're supposed to break off at at least 30 degrees, well, he would come down and especially if he looked like he was getting hits, he'd keep boring in on that target until he was almost shooting up your tail. And <laughs> I remember one time I saw some tracers blossom up to the left front of me and so I called him on that and said, hey, if you if you want to sh want to shoot at uh, live targets, get somebody else up here. Because <laughs> he, he he'd, he'd come around and instead of breaking off, he he kept right on coming because he looked like he was getting hits on the target. And all of a sudden, there was a burst that blossomed up in front of me, up to the left front, and uh, I let him know that I didn't appreciate that. <laughs> How many uh, fighter pilots would you say uh, went through the training program while you were there? 
Oh gosh, I, I have no idea. In the hundreds, thousands? Yes. Well, hundreds at least. Uh, let's see, I was, I was an instructor from, oh, the summer of 45 through 46. I was in the program about a year and we'd have roughly 30 pilots every 10 weeks, I'd guess. So you can do the math on that. The, uh, the, the, one of the big changes was they, they transferred the gunnery school from Matagorda Island to Ajo, Arizona. And uh, that was, that was interesting in itself because we, uh, had to, uh, switch from being concerned about bailing out over water to bailing out over the desert. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, from the time frame you're talking about, I suspect some of those F-86 pilots would have uh, ended up in the Korean War. Yeah, I expect so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, a good feeling that you taught them what they needed to know because the uh, uh, kill ratio in Korea was uh, marvelously in our favor when the F-86s arrived, so, yeah. and those, those pilots. Well, good for you. Time frame, as we just talked about, the F-86 pilots probably ended up in Korea. Uh, what was your activity uh, during, say, the 1950 uh, Korean War and on? Well, actually, I was in England for three years during Korea. I was there from 51 to 54. And uh, so I didn't get to Korea at all. Okay. Great. Thank you, my friend.